Okay, so this is uh, Lecture 3 of Rashi, His World and the Origin of Ashkenazic Jews by Rabbi Lawrence Troster. This is Lecture 3 on April 29th, 2015. And uh, this morning we're going to begin looking at Rashi's commentary to the Tanakh. And um, we're going to start with looking at his Torah commentary. Uh, and start with the first chapter of Genesis, first and second chapter of Genesis. Now, um, Rashi's uh, commentaries were eventually printed like his, um, like his Talmud commentaries and set up in, uh, I think, the 17th century in what is known as the Rabbinic Bible. Uh, like the Talmud where you have a text and then surrounding it with commentaries, you end up with this kind of standardized way of putting the biblical text and surrounding it with a variety of commentaries. So th this is, uh, this again, this is based on a 19th century edition, um, and the total for the entire uh, uh, Bible is five volumes, two to the Torah, two to the prophets, and one for the writings. And um, what it includes usually is the Aramaic translation of Targum Onkelos and uh, another Aramaic translation, the what's called the Yerushalmi or Targum Yonatan, and then a number of commentators, starting with Rashi, get, gets pride of place right underneath the biblical text, and this is in Rashi script. And then you get um, the two other most important ones. You get Ibn Ezra, the Spanish, uh, commentator, and then Ramban Nachmanides, who, combined, uh, who has read both Ibn Ezra and Rashi and comments on both of them, you will get, most of the time, you will have, um, they're not always consistent as to who else they have. Sometimes Rash Bam, Rashi's grandson, shows up in these commentators, not always. Um, th what's interesting, in this edition, there's a super commentary to Ibn Ezra, uh, as well as <clears throat> a kind of general super commentary down here. But what we also have is a Bala Turim, who is a um, 14th century um, Spanish rabbi, the Tour, who wrote uh, uh, the second most important uh, code of law in the Middle Ages, the one that came after the Mishnah Torah. And... Um, actually of Ashkenazic descent, but um, moved to uh, Toledo. And um, you have Sforno, who is a, again, um, uh, Span I think Spanish exile in uh, Italy. Um, so Rashbam is not here, uh, but many, you know, depending upon which edition, well, you see parts of it, they do put, uh, put Rashbam in. It's sort of inconsistent. Um, and sometimes at the back they put again some other some other people. So this is this is a, a quite interesting and it's quite useful. Um, of course, it's difficult to read as you get older um, the, the, the the print. But um, the commentaries uh, are in Hebrew. Yes, they're all in Hebrew. Of course, the Onkelos is uh, in Aramaic. Can you explain yeah, the Targum and the just what that is. Yeah, it, it is, it became the, the official Aramaic translation of the Torah uh, in the rabbinic period. Which one? Targum Onkelos. Oh, Targum Onkelos. Okay. Onkelos was supposedly a convert. Um, and um, what, what you had, uh, where's the, uh, Sam, the materials beside you? I, I, uh, so Ellie and... Did you take one? Yes. Uh, Ellie and Paul can get a copy for, from today. Um, uh, the Targums were um, around for a long time. Various Targums were around. Probably a lot of them were never written down. Um, and because in the Persian Empire, Aramaic became the everyday language of the Jews, it was necessary when um, reading the Torah in the synagogue to have somebody do a simultaneous translation into the vernacular. So eventually there grew up various Targums that became official, or represented Jews in different communities, Babylon and so on. We, uh, for example, it's very likely that the Bible that Jesus quotes is a Galilean Targum, right, that we don't have. Um, it, it's pretty evident from some of the way he, uh, some of the verses he quotes in the Bible and how they don't quite fit 
um, uh, even the, the Greek does, is not the Septuagint and so on and so forth. So the, there, there are numerous Targums, but the Onkelos became sort of the official one. Um, and it's, uh, it's a pretty literal translation. It really tries to stick to the text. It's not really heavily Midrashic, um, but it does downplay anthropomorphisms. Uh, the Targum Yonatan uh, is really um, uh, um, almost is a midrashic work in many ways, and so a lot of the targums are midrashic in that they don't just stick to trying to what we would call translating, but expanding the explanation. Yeah. I was going to say, what language is it translated into? Aramaic. It's Aramaic. It's, uh, targum is an Aramaic translation, as opposed to like the Greek translations, like the Septuagint, yes. and there's Achilles is another one uh, in Greek. Okay. Is this a Targum, an English word? Because it, no, it's an Aramaic word. But you know that the newspaper at Rutgers is called the Targum. Yes, I know, uh, but uh, it's an Aramaic word and it means translation. Okay, oh, okay. and so and why and the, they chose that I have no that idea, idea, but the um, the, um, uh, the 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 person who did the translating is called the Maturgaman. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 again, it's one of these words that starts ends up in Hebrew, but it's really of. Uh, I, it's of it's of Aramaic descent. Now, in the, when was this Targum of Nicolosa? Uh, sec, by second century CE, mm -hmm. but there were, evidently there were earlier Targums, and again, not I'm sure a lot of them weren't written down. A lot of them may have been extemporaneous, you know, while they while the Torah reading was going on. Um, now, what's interesting is in the last uh, five years or so, the Jewish Publication Society has been putting out an English version of this, the Mikrat Gadolod. Um, they just came out with Deuteronomy, which means they have, they, Genesis, for some reason, they're leaving to the last. This is the one for Exodus. Uh, and it's quite wonderful. So he translates, he, they have two English translations, the New J Jewish Publication Society and the Old Jewish Publication Society up at the top. Um, here's the Hebrew text. Here's Rashi. Um, here's Rashbam. Here's Ibn Ezra. Um, here's Nachmanides. Additional comments from a variety of other uh, uh, people. Um, and... He does, um, he does um, uh, cut down, the, like he edits it, so he doesn't like give you the complete explanation that Ibn Ezra, when he goes off into some astronomical mathematical calculations, he really cuts it down. But he tells you, there's some notes in it, and at the back he tells you who all these people are. Um, and so it's a really wonderful teaching tool, by the way. Um, they started with Exodus, then they came out with Leviticus, Numbers. They just published Deuteronomy a couple of months ago. I don't have Deuteronomy yet. Um, probably be a birthday present. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> Uh, Genesis will come out in another two years or so, probably. But it, it's really quite wonderful um, for um, adult education if you want to study the traditional medieval Jewish commentators. Is this available in a library? Uh, I have no idea. If it's, it depends on your library, I suppose. I doubt it would be in a public library. Um, but it's available from the Jewish Publication Society, or you can buy it through Amazon. It's actually, you know, it doesn't matter. So uh, that's, that's the other thing. This is a lot of show and tell here. Um, this is um, the translation of Rashi that um, a lot of people use. This is the, um, the Silberman translation, um, which uh, gives you the, the biblical text, the Targum, uh, Rashi in square script, not Rashi script, with uh, the vowels, uh, and an English translation. And he also fills in gaps, and he has notes and an appendix. It's not bad. It, you know, like he tells you when Rashi's quoting from a Midrash, which midrash it is, if we know, most of the time we do. So it, it's it's one of the, if you want to study, you know, Humish with Rashi in English, this is kind of like the standard edition, and it's been available for decades and in all kinds of cheap editions. Um, this um, is the critical, scholarly critical edition of Rashi's commentary to the Torah, meaning the scholar who did this many, many years ago, uh, Abraham Berliner, um, uh, went to all of the um, all of the uh, manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts and earliest printed editions of Rashi, and he created the you know a critical what we call in uh, historical thing a critical edition, showing the manuscripts variations and various <laughs> other things. So um, and uh, I can't remember when he did this originally. Uh, I think it was done in Germany. Yes, it was done in Germany. Uh, it was one of the great, uh, he was one of the scholars of the Wissenschaft des Judentums. Um, and um, reprinted in 
you know, Jerusalem and New York in 1969, my, my copy of it, but uh, when did he do this originally? Well, it was obviously before the Nazi period, but... Um, multiple volumes of that also? No, no, just this one volume that covers all of the Torah. He didn't do it for um, the other, uh, the, the Rashi's commentaries on the other, um, uh, the, the other um, books of the Bible, and I don't know whether there are critical editions of his commentaries on other books. Um, How many volumes of the Silverman text? Five, one for each, one, one for each of the Torah. Uh huh. So that's show and tell. Um, I brought along the Midrash Ra uh, first volume of the translation of the Midrash Rabbah. If we want to um, look at when Rashi's quoting the Midrash Rabbah, which he does a lot in this, uh, in, in what we're looking at, to see whether he changes it or how he, um, which ones he chooses, but. Okay, so, thought we started at the beginning, because um, he actually has a lot to say on the first two chapters of Genesis. And what you're going to see is his method of explaining a language by comparing to other biblical um, texts. You're going to see a heavy use of Midrash. And you're going to see a fair number of old French words show up to explain uh, terms. Um, and um, it's really quite interesting. Uh, there's also a few hints at um, uh, his own understanding of cosmology uh, and geography. Um, this is where I had to be careful with the Chabad translation because they made some mistakes in that regard. Um, Anyway, um, take a look at it. So, um, the Torah, and keep the Torah text open to page one, to the first chapter, and you see that the first verse of the Torah, Breshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim v'yat Aretz. Now, our translation, the Jewish Publication Society, translates the first verse as, a, as the beginning of a subordinate clause, when God began to create heaven and earth. And then verse 2 is a parenthetical clause of describing the state of the earth. And the actual sort of end of the sentence is verse 3. In other words, if you, if you knocked out verse 2, it would be when God began to create heaven and earth, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's the sentence. Mm -hmm. So, Bereshit is understood as when God began. Older translations, of course, say, in the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, which is not what the Hebrew says, but Rashi is going to discuss this, because there's actually a major theological divide if you say, when God began, versus in the beginning. And, in effect, the Septuagint translated it as, in the beginning, the ancient Greek-Jewish translation. So, what's interesting is, is that Rashi begins not with discussing that issue. That's in his second comment. His first comment, he's quoting his father. And he brings up a very interesting issue. Why does the Torah start with the story of creation? If the Torah is primarily a book of law, of mitzvot, that God gives to Moses on Mount Sinai, why does it go back to the beginning of the universe? Why doesn't it just start with the Exodus story? Okay, it's a really interesting issue, isn't it? So he quoting a tradition of his, his own father it's to explain this, probably out of you know respect for his father that he begins uh, with that. So, Suzanne, you want to start reading? Okay. We're on page one of the material. In the beginning, said Rabbi Isaac, it was not necessary to begin the Torah except from, quote, this month is to you. That's the beginning of the mitzvot in the Torah, chapter 12 of Exodus, the beginning of the telling of the laws of Passover. Which is the first commandment that the Israelites were commanded. For the main purpose of the Torah is its commandments. And although several commandments are found in Genesis, for example, circumcision and the prohibition of eating the thigh sinew, they could have been included together with the other commandments. Now, for what reason did he commence with in the beginning? Because of the verse, 
the strength of his works he related to his people to give them the inheritance of the nations from Psalms 111. Now, I just want to say anything that's in um, brackets is added. Um, mm -hmm. For clarification. Is added by um, the translator. Okay, the, for the, whole, the whole phrase mm -hmm. for the main purpose of the Torah and so on, that's not in Rashi. Got that? Oh, wait. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay, so, for if the nations of the world should say to Israel, quote, you are robbers, for you conquered by force the lands of the seven nations of Canaan, they will reply, the entire earth belongs to the Holy One, blessed be he. He created it. This we learn from the story of the creation. Yeah, and that's, a, that's not in the Rashi. And gave it to whomever he deemed proper when he wished. He gave it to them, and when he wished, he took it away from them and okay. gave it to us. Now, isn't that an interesting uh, point? That, that in order to establish the Jews' legitimacy uh, in the land of Israel, Eretz Yisrael, the Torah had to tell the whole story. Because, and this may be a polemic mm. that is being, Jews are being attacked for. Still. Still. <laughs> yes. There we go. Yes. <laughs> right. Right? You know, you stole the land, you conquered the land, therefore you're thieves. They would come back and say, God created the whole earth. God can decide who God wants mm -hmm. to give what land to. God gave it took it from them and gave it to us. So this is a, mm -hmm. you can almost see mm -hmm. this as a Devar Torah by his father. You know? Mm -hmm. And you can see it as part of a polemical uh, uh, atmosphere that went on. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned in my in the last couple of lectures, there are times when Rashi, in his commentaries, is definitely um, responding to Christian attacks. And, and polemics were a big part of Jewish-Christian relations at this point, to the point where there were, uh, in, pa in, in Paris, there was a public trial of the Talmud in the year 1240, which led to the burning of most of the Hebrew books in France, northern France, which destroyed uh, the Talmudic academies um, in uh, France. Okay? Um, so, and there are books of... Um, Polemics. I'll, I'll bring one in next time. That was one of the most important ones from the Middle Ages. It was translated into English, um, and so there's and there's a long history of Jews and Christians arguing, and also Jews, Christians, and Muslims arguing. You know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, but especially Jews and Christians, because going in and saying this is what this text means. No, this is what this text means. And part of part of Bible commentary, the impetus to Bible commentary, is to establish the Jewish meanings of biblical text that Christians are coming and saying something totally different. Uh, and in mm -hmm. fact, there was a, um, uh, in, North, in Paris, there was a, um, a place, uh, uh, an abbey of, what was called the Abbey of uh, St. Victor, and there was a whole school of Christian Bible commentators in the 11th century, not very much longer after Rashi died, who were talking to Jewish scholars and reading Rashi and Rashbam to begin to understand what we would call the pshat. In other words, this move towards trying to understand the plain meaning of the text, which Rashi is part of in the whole in the Jewish world, there's a, there's a similar thing going on in the Christian world. And, and there's been a lot of studies of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the various scholars, there's two in particular, Hugo of St. Victor and Andrew of St. Victor, who lived in the, in the 11th and 12th centuries, and their commentary, uh, commentaries on the Bible in which they uh, quote um, uh, Midrash and they quote uh, Rashi and they quote Rashbam, in other words, and they read Hebrew, okay? And they even say they were talking to Jewish scholars. The question is, they're, 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 I just recently found an article I haven't had a chance to read yet about how much actual direct influence was there back and forth is, of course, you know, people make PhDs about. Okay, so um, now, now he's going to get into the going back to the actual text itself, and uh, he starts with the Bereshit 
and notice it's translated in the beginning of God's creation, okay? Mm -hmm. So, go ahead. In the beginning of God's creation Hebrew of, Bereshit bara. This verse calls for a Midrashic interpretation. Because, All right, so skip. Any time that we don't have Rashi, let's try okay. and skip it. It teaches us that the sequence of the creation as written is impossible. As is written immediately, wait a minute now. We yeah, gotta, don't worry we about that. <laughs> as is written immediately below, as our rabbis state. And in brackets, these are the Rashi didn't put in his sources. This mm -hmm. is scholars who have sources. found the various sources. Um, go on. God created the world for the sake of the Torah, which is called, quote, the beginning of his way, and for the sake of Israel, who are called, from Jeremiah, the first of his grain. Okay, now this is a very interesting explanation, and here he's focusing on the word reshit. Okay, the word reshit, without the b, because the b mm -hmm. is a, you know, a, is a pronoun. Um, if you look up reshit, you get He's quoting two verses in the Bible where the word reshit shows up. And here he is relying on uh, Midrash Rabbah, uh, Genesis Rabbah, and um, where right at the beginning it talks about this issue of the term uh, reshit. And in um, Proverbs uh, uh, 8, 22, um, Lady Wisdom gives a soliloquy in chapter 8 of Proverbs, and she mm -hmm. refers to herself as the beginning of God's way, Reshit Darko. Mm -hmm. Okay? In effect, she says in this soliloquy, and Lady Wisdom is Chokhmah, that she was created before the universe was created, as uh, the implication being she was kind of like the plan. Okay? Now, this idea, then what happens is, is that in, by the second century BCE, Torah and Chokhmah, which were separate ideas, become elided into one, and Lady Wisdom Chokhmah is identified with Torah. So by the time you get to Breshit Rabbah, that identification has already been in existence for hundreds of years, several hundred years. And so when the uh, Proverbs, it says, the Lord made, be, made me as the beginning of his way, Reshit Darko, it's Torah talking. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the, um, uh, the verse from Jeremiah is also referring to the, the beginning of the grain harvest, the Reshit. The term there, again, is. So, in, um, he's, he's, He's saying here, and you'll see him a little explicit uh, later on, that the first chapter of Genesis is not specifically describing the order in which things actually were created, as you will see. But the original Midrash um, uh, says, um, beginning, Reshit refers to the Torah as in the verse, the Lord may be at the beginning of his way, Reshit Darko, Proverbs 8.22. And then it says that in effect, what um, God did was um, use the Torah as a, uh, it, actually it's a little earlier on, it says, um, I was the working tool of the Holy One, blessed be he, in human practice, when a mortal king builds a palace, he builds it not with his own skill, but with the skill of an architect. The architect, moreover, does not build it out of his head, but employ plans and diagrams to know how to arrange the chambers and the wicked doors. Thus, God consulted the Torah and created the world. Mm -hmm. So this Midrash is that the Torah is the blueprint of creation. Okay? Now, Rashi says this calls for a Midrashic interpretation. So this is the Midrashic. This is not the Pshat. Mm -hmm. Now, he's going to try and give you something. What is that? Um, uh, the, the Pshat. So read on if you wish to explain it. But if you wish to explain it according to its simple meaning, explain it thus. At the beginning of the creation of heaven and earth, the earth was astonishing with emptiness and darkness, and God said, let there be light. But scripture did not come to teach the sequence of the creation, to say that these came first, 
For if it came to teach this, it should have written, at first he created the heavens and the earth. Barishona, which means oh. in the beginning. Oh. Okay. For there is no sheet in scripture that is not connected to the following world. Words. We're meaning sorry. a construct state. Beginning of. Like. Like, in the beginning of the reign of Hoyakim. Hoy right. The beginning of his reign. The first of your corn. Here, too, you say... Bereshit bara Elohim. Like... Bereshit baro in the, in beginning, the beginning of, of creation. creation. And similar creating. to... Creating. 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 And similar to this is at the beginning of the Lord's speaking to Hosea. At the beginning of the speaking of the Holy One, blessed be he, to Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, etc. Now, if you say that it is that it came to teach that these, that is, heaven and earth, were created first, and that its meaning is, in the beginning of all, he created these and that, there are elliptical verses that omit one word, like Job 3.10, for he did not shut the doors of my mother's womb. And it does not explain who it was who shut the womb. And like Isaiah 8, he will carry off the wealth of Damascus, and it does not explain who will carry it off. And like Amos, or will one plow with cattle, and it does not explain if a man will plow with cattle. And like Isaiah 46, telling the end from the beginning, and it does not explain that it means telling the end of a matter from the beginning of a matter. If so, if you say that scripture indicates the order of creation, be astounded at yourself, for the water preceded, as it is written, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the water. And Scripture did not yet disclose when the creation of water took place. Okay, what is he trying to say here? Again, notice he's implying <laughs> to understand by quoting other mm -hmm. biblical verses to mm -hmm. learn how to understand the meaning of this. What is he saying here? What's he trying to get at here? He's saying... It's not an order. It doesn't describe the order. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And why is why is that important to him? He wants to go the wrong meaning. No. He's got an ideological thing here he's got to defend. If you take the Torah as our modern translations do, it's not creation ex nihilo. It's not creation okay. from nothing. Mm -hmm. There's a primordial matter. That's what he's talking about yeah. with the water, right? Mm -hmm. And since by Rashi's day, Jews did believe that creation was ex nihilo, that God created something from nothing, they can't read the Torah like this, like what we have. They had to read this in a different way. And so what Rashi, in effect, is saying is you the beginning of this is a general statement and not describing the actual order yet. It's not a historical retelling that there's a plan and that's what God does when God does it. But it's not, it's, it's not a report. There's an overall statement of creation, which the way he understands it can be ex nihilo, in the beginning, mm -hmm. right? Then it gets into the specifics. And as you will see, he actually believed that all matter was created on the first day, and the rest of cre the days of creation were separating everything out from a giant cosmic mush ball. Okay, because that's what he's saying. He's saying if you know if you um, if you think that this is the order of creation, then the creation of water took place first before the earth, and yet it says at the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Doesn't say you know. So, uh, read on, more over the heavens. Moreover, the heavens were created from fire and water. Perforce, you must admit that Scripture did not teach us anything about the sequence of the earlier and the later acts of creation. So, that's his way out of the dilemma. His way out of the dilemma of the primordial matter is to say we don't, hear, we don't have a true sequence of events. We have a general description of... Uh, the creation of the universe, and then we're going to get into the specifics. So he believes ex nihilo. Yeah, by his day, everybody mm -hmm. in the Jewish world pretty well does. Mm -hmm. But it's a fairly recent thing, by the way. The earliest evidence for that is only a hundred years or so before Rashi. In other words, there's no evidence in biblical texts, post-biblical texts, rabbinic texts, 
that ex nihilo became a dogma or a standard idea amongst the Jews. Mm -hmm. the, 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 there's no real hard evidence that they did this. It wasn't. It just wasn't an issue for them. It became an issue in the Middle Ages because of uh, of, a, of a philosophical challenge um, that Greek science believed that nothing can come from nothing. You can't have matter created out of nothing, and and what this became problematic for Christians earlier, by the way, and then Jews and Muslims, because what is central to one one of the important ideas to all Abrahamic uh, faiths is the resurrection of the dead in the days of the Messiah, or the end of time. So where does the well, let's look at it from Aristotelian science. You die, your body is made up of what we would call molecules of the basic matters of fire, air, earth, and water, mostly earth. So when you die, they dissipate and they get recycled into other beings, right? And then that generation dies and we're talking animals, plants, humans, and it, there's this constant recycling of this matter. So then at the end of time, how does God reconstitute the bodies of people when the matter that made up their bodies has been recycled into other people, who gets who gets the matter? Right. Right. So, in effect, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo is more about resurrection of the dead, because God can create new matter to resurrect the person. You see. Now, what's interesting is Saadja, who's the first mention of this, he doesn't like that idea. He finds a way around it through not having to create new matter. But he's, by his day, though, this notion of ex nihilo is an accepted um, doctrine of Judaism. Again, I've, I've read all kinds of stuff. There are people who say it goes back much earlier, but there's no absolute evidence before Sa'aja, who is in the 10th century, um, uh, that this was the case. Sa'aja is the first clear evidence in his philosophical work, The Book of Beliefs and Opinions where he discusses this issue under the issue of resurrection of the dead. So how does he believe a resurrection takes place? He thinks that God can kind of extend the matter of, uh, of uh, even if it's been recycled, he can kind of extend it. And, so he doesn't believe that you can create something out of nothing? Oh, he does he believe does. that God can create something out of nothing. He just doesn't think it's necessary when it comes to resurrection of the dead. In other words, he believes the universe was created something out of nothing, but he doesn't believe you have to go to this explanation um, to explain resurrection of the dead. He finds that a little uh, uh, difficult being a kind of more, you know, connected to Greek science and philosophy. He doesn't like the idea. But he quotes it. I mean, he says it. He mentions it. So um, this, is, this is what's lying behind uh, all this stuff. Rashi cannot accept the idea that there's primordial matter that coexists with God at the beginning. That's just not acceptable by his day. All right. Hmm. Mural, you want to carry on? God's creation of the heavens and the earth? God's creation of the heavens and the earth. But it does not say of the Lord's creation of, I, it should say of the Lord's, Lord God's creation of, as below to four, on the day that the Lord God made heaven and, and made earth and heaven. Yeah. For in the beginning, it was his intention to create it with the divine standard of justice. But he perceived that the world would not endure. So he preceded it with the divine standard of mercy, allying it with the divine standard of justice. And that is the reason it is written on the day the Lord God made earth and yep. heaven. This goes back to the rabbinic idea of the meaning of the two main names of God. The name of God, there's two main names of God, Elohim, and yod heh vav -Hey, the one we don't pronounce, that's translated as Lord. In the first chapter of Genesis, God is referred to as Elohim, which is a sort of generic word for God. In the second chapter of Genesis, um, after verse 4, it says, The Lord God, Adonai Elohim. So, in rabbinic tradition, Elohim is associated with God's midat hadin, God's attribute of judgment. Adonai, yod -Hey vav -Hey, is associated with God's attribute of rachamim, mercy. So, 
why only was Elohim utilized in the first chapter of Genesis? As, you know, why doesn't it say Adonai Elohim like it does in chapter 2? Okay? And he, um, and you will see that Rashi is going to take um, what we, in, as moderns, take as two separate creation stories from two separate sources. And that's one of the things he's trying to deal with, is to, how do you, how do you take care of the contradictions between the two? Mm, two creation uh, stories. The two creation mm -hmm. stories. How do you deal with the different terminology for um, God? As you will see, how do you deal with the, with the differences in between a creation of gender? which is very different in chapter 1 than chapter 2. So he's seeing these not as separate sources, but as one story, and he's trying to sort of pull it all together. And that's what he's going to do, because he wants to show us how, you know, they are not separate, but part of the same story, but complementary. One explaining the other. Yeah, Suzanne, you had a question. Well, yes, because he feels that if he created with the standard of justice, course, the deen. world would not endure. Right, because exactly. Because it would be too harsh. To yes, do. yes, the world could not endure uh, perfect uh, justice. Um, that That's what he's saying, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and when you get to, there's all this midrashic mm -hmm. stuff about, you know, when the humans created, the angels are on two sides and, you know. So, so since God is perfect... Yeah. Then there would have been a mistake if it was only judgment and humans couldn't tolerate that. They had to come up with some way. It's to not humans. The, earth, the universe itself can't run according to strict judgment. Okay? Which it, it says a lot about, let's say, human society, meaning right. if there you have a judge, a judge cannot always be strictly judgmental but has to show mercy mm -hmm. that's the human analogy can't work that way okay here i'll read on now we're in verse two There's a now just take a look remember verse two is um the earth being unformed and void mm -hmm. tohu vavohu mm -hmm. so this this word tohu vavohu is a very odd phrase. Tohu does show up in other parts of the Bible, only very rarely. Um, vohu doesn't really. Um, it's, it's almost like a rhyming slang, according to one of my uh, teachers. He would translate it as chaos shmeos. Uh, <laughs> uh, but unformed and void. Uh, Robert Alter does a wonderful mm -hmm. translation. He calls it welter and waste. To get that alliterative mm -hmm. sound mm -hmm. in English, that Hebrew has an alliterative sound, tohu vavohu, um, uh, and he, you know, uses the old, a very old English term, welter. Um, so he's now going to try and understand, given it is a rare term, uh, especially bohu, what does this mean? Where does it come from? What is it? So read on. Desolate and void. Um, the, the word, word tohu. The word tohu is an expression of astonishment and desolation that a person wonders and is astonished at the emp emptiness therein. Uh, astor Astorison in Laaz. Yeah, yeah. In old French. Um, Astorismon. In modern French. Astonishment. In English. And a, an expression of emptiness and desolation. Vohu. Now, it, it's fascinating. He gets this astonishment from finding a root, um, you know, that is, and he's, he's wrong on this, but he, he finds, he finds that this, the, connects it with this word astonishment, that hmm. it's, it's astonishingly um, void. Void. Empty. Desolate. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and it, to explain it, because it's such an unusual term in Hebrew, both of them, he has to resort to, and of course, in the original, it doesn't say Old French. It mm -hmm. says laaz, meaning the vernacular, meaning his vernacular that he spoke day to day, meaning what we call Old French. Yeah. Okay? And as I mentioned last time, Rashi is a major source of Old French uh, words. Um, the problem is, is that because he did, there's no vocalization, sometimes we're not quite sure what words they are. Uh, but in this particular case, um, we can figure out 
um, you know, <laughs> what it is. Okay? All right. Now we've got the phrase, Choshech al panei tohum, the darkness on the face of tohum, which is translated as deep. It can mean primordial water. It's a very odd term. Uh, it, well, it's, it's used in... It's used in the Bible, Hebrew Bible, to mean the primordial waters of creation. That, looking at it from the biblical perspective, there was this part of this original primordial, the vast majority of this primordial matter was water. It was the basic resource out of which creation emerges and becomes a kind of agent of creation later on in the chapter because God says, let this the emerge out of the water, and, and then the earth then becomes also an agent. But um, notice, uh, read what he says, on the face of the deep. On the face of the deep, on the face of the waters which were on the earth. Notice he's, he's oh. not seeing, he's, he's not, ex his, in his cosmology, the earth is primary. There is this earth, and he is living at a time when they believe that the earth was a sphere of matter, that is at the center of the universe. This is the Ptolemaic universe, not the biblical universe. And because um, this is in already in the Talmud, so it's absorbed in Talmudic tradition. So for him, the primary matter of the earth is earth, and the water is on top of it, the oceans and the rivers and so on. Whereas in the biblical uh, uh, cosmology, the primary matter is water which the earth is floating on top of, so to speak. Okay, so this shows his own uh, beliefs about the universe in his time. Read one more, in the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was hovering. The throne of glory was suspended in the air and hovered over the face of the water with the breath of the, of the mouth of the Holy One. Blessed be he, and with his word, like a dove, which hovers over the nest, they, they are, are in old French to cover, hover over. Okay, so um, he is referring here to certain midrashic uh, concepts found in Midrash Rabbah and in the Talmud, in Tractate Chagiga, that um, the throne of glory, the Kisei Hakavod, meaning, don't forget, they had a fairly... Uh, Arashi was no philosopher, so he believed in a fairly anthropomorphic conception of God as a being who lives in a physical heaven and has a throne called the Kisei HaKavod, the throne of glory, and that which is the divine chariot, the Merkava that Ezekiel sees, right? The vision of Ezekiel with this, God, with this divine being sitting on a chariot made out of living creatures with wings flying around. Okay, which is the representation of the ark in the in the temple. So he's saying is that what you have here, the ruach Elohim, he is understanding as the this merkava, this divine mm -hmm. chariot and throne that is hovering, as he says, like a dove hovering over its nest. Mm -hmm. And he's alluding to a, a passage in the Talmud where one of the rabbis. Uh, who early rabbis of the second century, who is a mystic, is sitting in contemplation, wondering the space between the kisei hakavod and the surface of the water, and he's spending his whole, he's in a trance contemplating this. And one of his rabbinic authorities, who comes by and sees him and asks him what he's doing, and he says this. After hearing this, the the, the leader turns to his other colleagues and says, "This guy's gone. <laughs> he's he's out of here." <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, read one more. Verse 4. Uh, and God saw the light that it was good, and God separated. Okay, so that's that's the point. All right, that verb separated is important. Go on, here too. Here too, we need the word of the Akadah. He saw, he saw it that it was not proper for the wicked to use it, so he separated it for the righteous in the future. According to, to its simple... Meaning. Okay, stop there. First, he gives you the Midrashic explanation. Mm -hmm. And what is the issue? There is a light that is produced at the beginning of creation. But then, on the fourth day of creation, the sun and the moon and the stars are created. So what is the relationship between the light of the sun and the luminaries and this primordial light? Mm -hmm. And there is a Midrash that, in effect, says 
that this primordial light is set aside, that the light we see is not this primordial light, it's set aside for the righteous in the days of the Messiah. And this was the light that was revealed to Moses that allowed him at the end of his life to see from one land of the one corner of the land of Israel to the other. Is that the phrase, or Zeruah? Yeah, Zeruah? exactly, in the liturgy. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, no, no, that's yeah. from Psalms. That, that, no, that's not it. There's, in, in the traditional liturgy, at the end of the first blessing before the Shema, it says, Or Chadash al Tzion Ta'ir, may a new light shine upon Zion. It's an allusion to that. Okay, now he's going to give you the pshat, the simple meaning. Go on. Explain it as follows. He saw, he saw it, that it was good, and it was unseemly that it, light and darkness should serve in confusion. So he established for this one its boundary by day, and for that one its boundary by night. Okay, so here he's taking the notion of, and he separated that God creates boundaries, categories, which is exactly in tune with what is happening in First Genesis. All right. Irma, do you want to pick it up, the next so, one? Question. Yeah. Yeah. One, four. Mm-hmm. It seems like they left out the rest of the sentence and God separated, what does it say after that? The light from the darkness. Yeah, he doesn't say every word. I mean, he doesn't comment on every word. And, and he skips verses. In other words, he, he only explains the things he feels compelled to explain. Okay? One day. According to the sequence of the language of the chapter, it should have been written the first day. Yom Rishon. Not Yom Achad, because, read on. As it is written regarding the other days, second, third, fourth, why did scripture write one? See, if you look at the second, the end of the second day of creation, it says Yom Sheni, then Yom Shlishi. Uh -huh. So the first end should have said Yom Rishon. Uh -huh. It says Yom Achad, one day. Uh -huh. So this is what's bothering him. Go on. Because the Holy One, blessed be He, was the only one in his world, the angels were not created until the second day. Uh, Yom Echad is understood as the day of the only one. So is it explained in Genesis Rabbah. Okay, so he's giving a midrashic that there is a homiletical explanation that God at this point is Achad, alone, the only one. And that the, and according to Midrash Rabbah, which he's basing this on, um, the angels are created on the second day, so God does not yet have a heavenly court. Okay? That doesn't sound like the simple meaning. That sounds it like isn't. <laughs> it isn't. It isn't. Right. And, and again, I mean, I could have brought a modern commentary so we could go look at what the modern biblical yeah. scholars, but we don't have to do that. Okay? This is a midrash. He, but he's saying, he's telling you it's a midrashic explanation. What, what is the explanation again? I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm, I seem to miss this. Which one? What he's saying? Yeah. Okay, so in Hebrew... Um, I, I got the, you know, instead the of saying Echad, day, he should have, if it was going to say first day, it would have said Yom Rishon, which is, right. by the way, what we call the first day of the week. Sunday is Yom Rishon. Mm -hmm. You know, Monday is Yom Sheni, and so on and so forth. So when you look at the other days of creation, they use that system of, nu of right. numeric. But the first day, it says Yom Echad, which doesn't mean first, means one. So what is his explanation for that? I mean, his explanation is is that it's it, it is that it's to it's to teach us that God was alone, that God was the only being in existence at the time. That's what he says. Okay. Okay. All right. Now he's going to verse six. Verse six is uh, the second day. Let there be vayomer Elohim yehi rakia. Let there be an expanse. Betochamayim, in the midst of the water. So, in the biblical cosmology, you have this primordial water, and then God creates a physical barrier that separates the upper waters where our rain and precipitation comes from. It's a literal physical barrier from the lower waters from which we have our oceans and lakes and rivers. Okay? But he's going to see that a little differently. So, read on. Let the expanse be strengthened. For although the heavens were created on the first day, they were still moist, and they solidified on the second day from the rebuke of the Holy One, blessed be He, when He said, Let there be an expanse. This is what Scripture says, Job 26. The pillars of the heavens trembled the entire first day, 
and on the second day they were astonished by his rebuke, like a person who stands in astonishment because of the rebuke of the one who frightens him. And the word astonishment is, you know, he is where he gets the root for, you know, he sees the root for tohu. Um, uh, but what is, what he has a, so what he's getting out of Genesis Rabbah is that the rakia is not a, a um, like almost like a metal barrier, but is rather ice. It's, it's, it's a barrier of ice okay. where the... They solidified into ice. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, it's pretty okay. much an ice. It's kind of like a, you know, that um, the, the moisture from the first mm -hmm. day is now solidified into like a barrier of ice. Okay. And rebuke. Yeah, meaning he's taking he's taking um, he's taking the idea that um, the that God takes a direct command to cause them to as if someone is like freezes in astonishment. You know, I, I, it, rebuke to me sounds like being scolded. Yeah, here I think it just it kind of means um, you know the power of his for example, like freeze. You know, <laughs> go on. In the midst, in the of, the midst water. of the water. In the middle of the water. According to the Targum. You see here he's quoting the Targum Onkelos. Right. For there is a separation between the upper waters and the expanse, as there is between the expanse and the waters that are on the earth. Behold, you have learned that they are suspended by the word of the king. Okay, so there, there it is. In other words, um, he's, he's giving you um, the idea that the upper waters... Um, that there is a um, separation, he says, between the upper waters and this barrier, which in the biblical cosmology there actually isn't. It kind of touches it. And, but then also there's the separation between the rakia, the barrier, and the lower waters, which is what we call the sky. Right? And, but this is all done by the word of God. Okay? B'ma'aro shel melech. And again, here he is um, basically, you know, quoting from the a tractate from the Talmud uh, and Genesis Rabbah. Okay. Uh, Irma, you want to read a couple more? And God made the expanse. He fixed it upon its base, which is what is meant by making it as in Deuteronomy. And she shall do... For nails. Okay, so th th this is this is interesting. Um, the um, here in the in the text, if you go back to the text in the Tanakh itself, the primary word for create, the verb to create, is the word bara, Beit Resh Aleph. It is a verb that is only utilized in the Tanakh of God and referring to creation. What you have here is all of a sudden a different verb, a common word, asa, which is used to mean to make or to do, rather than one of the typical words for creating. As you'll see, there's even other words for forming, creating, and so on. So that's why is that uh, you know, you know, it's unusual that it's here. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't it say bara Elohim? You know, created the. But this is important, as you will see, because for him, all of the bara, all of the creating, took place on the first day, and now all we've got is separation. Mm -hmm. So he's using, he's 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 wanting us to understand that making it in this case is the same as the use in Deuteronomy. 2112. I think we should look that up because it sounds so weird. Um, uh, Deuteronomy 2112. Um, which is on page 420. This is the law of um, when you're going to war and you capture a beautiful woman. Okay. And it says here that when you bring her into your house, she has to trim her hair and she has to pare her nails. And the word for paring is the word, the verb, the, the, the word asa, 
uh, meaning it's it's to make her nails or to do her nails, which our translation has interpreted to mean pairing. Yeah. But um, what Rashi understands is that making in the sense of doing, right? Isn't that what they do when they go, go to Mitzvah, do something with the nails? Yeah, that's true too. But there's, there's these laws about the captive uh, woman, uh, you know. Clean the nails, I would think. Who knows? Well, cut, I mean, our, our translation thinks it means that she has to cut her nails. So, mm -hmm. you know. But he sees, a, he sees an understanding of the use of this verb with that other verse. Okay, read one more and then we'll move above on. Above the expanse. Okay, so above the expanse um, is, of course, Bain Hamayim Asher Me'al Lurakia, the water that was above the expanse. In other words, there's a separation between the upper waters and the lower waters. Go on. Uh, it does not say on the expanse, but above the expanse, because they, the waters, are suspended in the air. Now, I notice he's being very careful about reading it. I mean, the, the plain sense of the word is just means above, and it doesn't mean whether it's touching or not touching. He's saying there's a space between the upper waters and the rakia itself. And he gets this from Midrash on Psalms. Go on. Now, why does it not say that it was good on the second day? This is a very important thing. Every other day of creation, it mm -hmm. says that God looked at it and said it was yeah. tov. But the second day... It doesn't. Okay. On the third day, interesting enough, it says it twice. Okay. Because the work involving the water was not completed until the third day, although he commenced it on the second day, and an unfinished thing is not in its fullness and its goodness. And on the third day, when he completed the work involving the water, and he commenced and completed another work, he repeated therein that it was good twice, once for the completion of the work of the second day and once for the completion of the work of that third day. And he's oh. right. And what's interesting is, is therefore, in the Jewish tradition, it's, a bad, it's considered bad luck to get married on a Monday. Oh, for ah. heaven's sake. Because there's no tov. But it's okay. good luck to get married on a Tuesday, which has a wow. double tov. Well, ah. my, my first marriage was on a Tuesday. No, but that, you'll find that's something uh, that not strictly followed, but yeah. um, that's something that was uh, one of part of Jewish folklore. Yeah, no, I Picked always heard it was good yeah, luck exactly. to get married on a Tuesday. Exactly. And that's why, because there's a double tov. Was that why you were married on Tuesday? I don't remember so many years ago. Okay, so, I mean, you know, he's right about this, by the way. That's probably the reason why it isn't on the second day, because the actions of the mm -hmm. second day were not completely finished until the third day. Okay, Cal, do you want to pick it up on uh, one eight? And God called the expanse heaven. Hebrew. Shamayim. This is a combination of the word mayim, sa, their water. Um, Genesis Rabba 4 7, there is water. Or? Fire and water. Esh Umayim. He mingled them with one another and made the heavens from them. So the word, um, the, the word Shamayim, which is just the plural of, you know, meaning heavens, the, this is again, this is a midrash saying it's. It's a double word that's put yeah, together, yeah. which can be sa maim or sham maim, right? Again, fiddling around with the sh and s, mm -hmm. but sa maim means bare water. Sham maim is there is water. Or what's most commonly understood that um, the sheen is a contraction of the word esh, meaning fire. Mm -hmm. Fire and water. So that's the more common one. Again, this is all from the Talmud Chagiga, which is uh, the Tractate Chagiga in uh, second chapters, filled with all kinds of mystical and cosmological speculation. This is where he's getting it from. Okay. All right. Read the next one, verse 9. Now, verse 9 is, um, God said, Let the waters below the sky be gathered into one area that dry land may appear. Go on. They were spread out over the surface of the entire earth. And he gathered them in the Oceanus, 
which is the largest of all the seas. Yeah, this is very interesting. In the, in the online translation, it said Mediterranean, and I knew that that was wrong, <laughs> and because if you go back to his Hebrew, he says Okeanos. Mm -hmm. Now, what is Okeanos? Uh, Okeanos is the, in the Greek geography, is the primordial ocean mm -hmm. that surrounds all of the land of which all other seas and rivers are expressions, and Okeanos is actually in Greek mythology, is actual uh, god. Um, but Rashi didn't mean Mediterranean. He meant mm -hmm. Okeanos, which was commonly believed that there was this, you know, because people didn't know the extent of the land mass of the earth, and, mm -hmm. you know, the, you go east out of the Mediterranean, there's this Atlantic Ocean, you go down, there's an Indian Ocean, and, you know, so they just thought that there was this primordial ocean that surrounded all the land masses, and that's what he was referring to. Okay? Read on. 110, he called seas. But is it not one sea? In other words, is, isn't Okeanos, in effect, make all the water of the earth just one ocean? Go on. However, the flavor of a fish that comes up from the sea in Accra differs from the flavor of a fish that comes up from the sea in Aspamia. Now, Aspamia, we're not sure um, what it is. Um, it could mean, um, it could be, uh, 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 it could be um, a, a manuscript error for Hispania. It could mean Spain. Because mm -hmm. don't forget, in Marashi's day, they didn't necessarily, Jews didn't call Spain consistently Sfarad yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, no uh, they use the Greek, the Latin term Hispania, mm -hmm. so um, we don't know what exactly he's referring to. It could refer to um, some other place that's not that far, you know, from Eretz Yisrael. Okay, go on. One eleven. Let the earth sprout vegetation, seed yielding herbs. Desha. Desha does not have the same meaning as Asaph. Now, if you go to one eleven. It says, Vayomer Elohim, Teche Haaretz, Deshe, Asev, Mazria, Zera, Eitz, Pri. So it's using various terms here. The word, the verb, um, Dasha, means to sprout vegetation. But then you have Deshe as one kind of, uh, of term, um, Asev. And then you have, which is translated here as seed-bearing plants of every kind. And then you have eight pre-fruit trees of every, every kind, bearing fruit. Okay? So you have these different terms for various kinds of plants. And so Rashi's kind of trying to parse that out. So Desha is not the same as Asaph, he's saying. Read on. And it would have been inappropriate for the scriptural text to use the expression ta'asiv ta ha'aretz that the earth bring forth herbs for there are various species of desha each one by itself which is called a particular asev and it would not be the correct term for the speaker to say such and such desha because the term desha applies to the earth's covering when it is filled with vegetation. So, in effect, what is he saying here? He's saying there is a, looking at it in taxonomy, desha is a general term mm -hmm. for seed-bearing plants as opposed to trees. And uh, within that general term, there are subspecies, which are asev. And I mean, you know, uh, the, the text of the Torah itself is giving us a taxonomy mm -hmm. of plants here. And Rashi's trying to parse out that. I mean, all, all you know, uh, cultures have taxonomies of the way plants and animals are categorized. And you have it in the first chapter of Genesis. You have what is the priestly taxonomy. And, and of course, Rashi's working off of that, but also... In from his own medieval taxonomies, which are ex, uh, a lot more expanded. Mm -hmm. Okay, read on. Let the earth sprout. Let the earth sprout. Let it be filled and covered with a mantle of herbs. In Old French, Desha is called herbedis, herbage, mm. all in a mixture, whereas each root individually is called Asa. There you go. Okay, so again, he gives you the Old French, herbage, or 
All right, in English. All right, read on. Seal, seed yielding. That its seeds should grow in it from which to sow elsewhere. So seed crops. Mm -hmm. He's interpreting this as seed crops because he knows that farmers have to keep a certain amount of their crops mm -hmm. aside for seeding the following year. I mean, he knows this. This is, you know, well-known agricultural practice. Read on. Fruit trees. That the taste of the tree should be like the taste of the fruit. It, the earth, did not do so, however, but the earth gave forth its separate trees producing fruit. But the trees themselves were not fruit. Therefore, when man was cursed because of his iniquity, it, uh, the earth, too, was punished for its iniquity and was cursed. <laughs> okay. okay. This is, again, a little kind of midrashic okay. thing here. All right, read, read on. In which its seed is found. These are the kernels of every fruit from which the tree grows when it is planted. The pits. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's interpreting um, in verse um, uh, 111 and 112. Um, where it says, Eitz Oseh Pri Asher Zaro Bo Leminehu, the trees, uh, fruit trees of every kind, bearing fruit with the seed in it, meaning the pit. Mm -hmm. That a fruit is no, noted by the pit, the seed in it. Read one more. And this is 112 now. And the yes. earth gave forth, etc. Even though Leminehu, according to its kind, was not said regarding the herbs when they were commanded to grow. They heard that the trees were commanded thus, and they applied an a fortiori argument to themselves. A calvachomer. From the minor to the major, as it explained in the Agadah of Tractate Hulim. So this is, this is a, a cute little midrash, because if you go back to the text, it says um, that, it just says that what the vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and then the fruit trees um, you know, are given the idea that the fruit trees are leminehu, according to their kind, and the plants got angry um, and felt left out. And so they, uh, they applied, in effect, as they argued with God, with a kalbahomer saying, well, you know, if all the fruit trees are leminehu, so we should be leminehu, and it's, it's, it's kind of a cute little midrash here. Last, I think it was last week, you said how, you know, the grandson said, hey, you didn't go far enough with a shot, a shot. Exactly. And, you, and you can see where he's coming from, because <laughs> yes. this, is, this is so much mystery. Yes, but he, you see there's a combination. Yes, there's a combination, combination of mm -hmm. both trying to understand the grammar, the vocabulary, the use of vernacular translation to sort of really focus on what is the meaning of that word for an audience that doesn't know Hebrew as well. Um, on the other hand, it's, he's quoting all kinds of these uh, midrashim you know, homiletical midrash. Yeah. So that's why I said he's kind of the, he's kind of the link between the more stricter shot commentaries of his grandson and Ibn Ezra and the rabbinic midrash, which is rarely dealing with what we would call pshat. Yeah. More interested in the meaning of the verse in the, as a homiletical thing to get a message across rather than so much a descriptive mm -hmm. There's ideology and so on and so forth. Jackie, you had a question? Yeah, yeah. Because how much are they feeling that the plants are really talking? You know, this this kind of thing. You know? Well, the midrash and, is filled with that kind of stuff. And, you know. And yeah, yes, and we accept it as you know. As midrash. Yeah, you know, it's something that's so an interesting allegory. story that gives you some kind of a meaning, but it's not mainly literally true. Well, yeah, and I and I think mm -hmm. uh, I think what Ellie just said is it's a kind of allegory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Would they see it as that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it's the kind of thing you'd hear in a sermon. <clears throat> well, there's, yes. a, there's a famous one about, you know, all the mountains wanting to be the, the mountain of where the Torah is being, right. you know, well, and they come, come and give, make their case to God, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, I don't think people took that literally. I think it's wonderful imagination. Well, but they would accept it as an explanation. They, they, they would... They would I think they would enjoy it. That's yeah, what yeah. yeah, that's the point. You have to, again, you have to understand Midrash often, I think, comes out of, it's not a bunch of guys sitting around like us and trying to make up stories. It's, it, a lot of it is, comes out of sermons in front of synagogue, you know, synagogue groups, right? Uh, in, in the synagogue on Shabbat morning. So you have to look at it as um, the, the, the person who's giving the Devar Torah, the Darshan, has to be entertaining to get their message across. In other words, they're trying to get across a message, like any good sermon, moral message, whatever, 
and they're employing allegory and metaphor like they will say, just as a king of flesh and uh, unlike a king of flesh and blood who does X, God is this, you know, they will create these stories because they want, in some cases they use jokes, some cases off-color jokes, we have evidence of that. Um, they want to keep their, the people they're speaking to entertained, and they want to teach them something, and when you look at what we have in some collections of Midrash are a complete sermon, by the way. Most of them are fragments. What we have are fragments of sermons. Um, they always end on a messianic note, meaning, don't worry, redemption is coming. So mm -hmm. to give people hope. Yeah, Lynn. Some of it is also, uh, I, I keep on thinking, of, there are children's stories, there are fables, you know, where the uh -huh. fox doesn't eat the grapes. Or yeah, exactly. Like Jews that. knew that and, stuff. And, the, and that's how we explain things. Yeah, no, but you know, what I'm thinking of is like, um, on Shabbat, you know, we say we talk for hours, so it shouldn't yes. be insulted. But right. that's, I understand, it's not the real, real reason why that is done, but it's an interesting interpretation and something we say and it exactly. gives us pleasure. Exactly. Know. Well, why else do we cover Do you that? know the reason? <laughs> well, my explanation was that um, it's not really supposed to be on the table yet. It's supposed to give you attention to the, to the blessing over the wine. And then you don't want to be distracted, right. It's a way of attention. focusing on the thing you're actually supposed to say the bracha on. <laughs> Um, in a, on the last day of Passover, when we were going to have then have Chalik, you know, I could smell the house. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was off to the side. We were going to we could make the most. I really, I said to somebody next to me, Do, "Is that?" Is it hollow that I smell? <laughs> Dreaming of hollow. Okay, Linda, you want to pick it up? Sure. One fourteen. Let there be luminaries. Let there be luminaries, etc. They were created on the first day and on the fourth day. He commanded them to be suspended in the sky, and likewise, all the creations of heaven and earth were created on the first day, and each one was fixed in its proper place on the day that was decreed upon it. That is why it is written. With the heavens, eight Hashemayim, to include their products, and with the earth, the eight ha arets to include its products. Okay, uh, there's a translation problem here. Okay, um, just the way uh, it makes it sound like they were uh, the way the sentence is written in English. They were created on the first day and on the fourth. No. Uh, they were created, it, he, the word used is bara, the verb uses bara. They were created on the first day, mm -hmm. but on the fourth day they were suspended. Okay, so notice what he says. This is critical to his understanding yeah. of the sequence of creation. Right. All the creations in heaven and earth were created on the first day. In other words, there was one act of creation ex nihilo. Okay. Only one the first day. In the beginning, God created in the heavens and earth. That's it. Done. What gets created is a cosmic mush ball where all the various aspect things that are created are all mixed up. And subsequently, the verb that's constantly used is separation. Put in its proper place. And each one was fixed in its proper place on the day that was decreed upon it. Okay? Okay. That's the point. As it is written, with the heavens, et a shemaim, meaning using the term et, which is not usually translatable. Et is a non-translatable word in biblical Hebrew that refers to an object. Bereshit bara Elohim, God, when God began to create et a shemaim, the heavens, the et ha'aretz. But et, aleph taf, can also be understood as ito, or eat. There's a, there's a word that means with. So it you could understand it as with the heavens to include their products and with the earth to include its products. <coughs> That's a midrash. Taking the et instead of being the, the object um, signifier and translating it instead, even though the, the vocalization doesn't say it that way, translating it as the word with. Everybody got that? That's what he's saying. That's his proof. That the first verse means with God created 
in the beginning, God created with the heavens to include their products and with the earth to include its products. That's the way he understands the first verse of Genesis. He's finally got to us. All right? He told us he was going to do this, and that's what he does. Okay? Everybody understand that? Because this, this is an important comment, a really important comment. I want to make sure everybody fully understands that. Okay. Read on. Let there be luminaries. Let there be luminaries. Yahid. Me'orot. Me'orot. If the word me'orot is written... It, not if. It. It. it the word me'orot is written without a vav. Okay. Meaning, normally, mm -hmm. um, it should be written with a vav. Meaning, it would be mem, aleph, resh, vav, taf. Mm -hmm. That's the normal way you write a feminine ending uh, plural is usually the, 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 you have a vav, but here it's not, which happens in Biblical Hebrew. There's a term for this, chaser and malay. Chaser means where it is lacking that letter. Malay meaning it is full. Okay? All right? And then he's saying, because it doesn't have the vav, it can mean me'erot. Again, take the same letters, put different vowels, and you end up with the word for curses. Mm -hmm. Go on, because it... Because it, the fourth day, is a cursed day, when children become ill with croup. This is what we learned on the fourth day of the week. They, the men of the Ma'amad, would fast, so that children should not become ill with croup. So, in his own folklore, again, this is deriving from the tractate in the Talmud, tractate Tanit, which is the... Um, a tractate devoted to fasting for various things. Um, apparently, the fourth day, meaning Wednesdays, Wednesday are times when Wednesday. children are more likely to come down with croup. So it is a day of me'erot, curses. This is, that's, that's completely not shot, as you can imagine. This is completely, you know. The croup is his words. Well, whatever, however we translate it. Uh, what is it? In, let me find it. What it is in the Hebrew, um, but that's the way. It, that's the way it, it's understood. Hang on. That could be very well because that's a childhood illness that's very common. Very common, sure. exactly. Well, I'm just wondering. Well, what's very common? I, mean, I don't know when the word croup came about. Maybe the eighteenth, eighteen hundreds. Yeah, but the it, it, but they could have understood this. Well, I yeah. just wonder what it says. Uh, it says. Um, it says askara. What is that referring to? Something. It's to a one? disease. It's a to a disease. I'd have to look it up it say in one, a Talmudic dictionary. Is that in one fourteen? No, it's no, not actually no, in the Torah. That's yeah, the yeah, point. Yeah, it's a midrash. I'd have to go back okay. Okay. to my uh, uh, Talmudic dictionary, which, if you're interested, Sam, I will be happy to do <laughs> and okay. see what the word um, uh, means. It's but a midrash, uh, that's different. No, no, but I'm I because it, it's interesting. It's it's a, it's a term for a childhood illness yeah. that has been translated into English as croup. So I'm going to mark down I'll, when I get home. I will <laughs> I will look this up and see what it says in uh, Jastro um, and. The problem is when you're dealing with things like uh, diseases like this, it's sometimes very mm -hmm. difficult to tra to know exactly what they were referring to, mm -hmm. because the term bad, bad respiratory mm -hmm. tract infection. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, yeah, I'll look it up in, in okay. Jastro. That's right. Uh, as a matter of fact, if there's a Jastro around here, which I don't think it's. I don't know. But... When Edward was what? When Edward was nine years old, all of a sudden he could hear his breathing, but he couldn't feel himself breathe out, and the doctor said he had the croup. Right. So. What is the croup, by the way? <laughs> it's a severe cough with, uh, which involves mainly the, the larynx, the upper airway, so uh -huh. you have trouble. Oh, yeah. oh okay. It just sounds like okay. they yeah. yeah. take a child into a hot shower. Oh, oh, so much of the humidity is soothing. Yeah. Right, right. So maybe it's maybe it's okay, so it's a common childhood illness, so, though. Maybe they're referring to pertussis. We'll think of. Uh -huh. well, that would be cool. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look. It's really inspiratory. Oh, it's really Stray, yeah. I mean, there are people who study these terms for diseases in classic Jewish sources to try and figure out what they are. I mean, it's an incredibly, you know, difficult mm -hmm. uh, thing to do because then mm -hmm. does this word come from a Greek word, which it doesn't look like a Hebrew word, mm -hmm. um, askara, 
Um, is it Aramaic? Is it Greek or, or Latin? Where do, what does it mean? I mean, I, I'll, I'll go look it up and I'll let what you guys the know. You're referring to? Oh, it's a it's the standard dictionary of uh, Talmudic uh, Aramaic and Hebrew. In other words, when you're studying Talmud and you need a dictionary to look up a word, uh, Jastro was uh, written at this point a hundred years ago, and supposedly I heard years ago somebody was you know doing a whole new edition, but essentially it's the standard. Uh, Diction and you can actually download it online for free because it's in the public domain. And so I have this, you know, two-volume one that's heavily thumbed from my <laughs> days in rabbinical school. Okay. All right. Read one more. To when? separate between the day and between the night. Okay. So again, we're in verse 14, mm -hmm. and it says there, Lehavdil, right? Right. Exactly. Lehavdil ben hayom uvein halayla. Okay, read on. Uh, this happened after the first light was hidden away. Remember, there was the primordial light, mm -hmm. and now you've got the secondary light of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Go on. But during the seven, another reading during the three, seven days of creation, the primordial light and darkness served together, both by day and by night. This is some kind of uh, midrash? According to the Rambam, Ramban and early editions of Rashi. All right, now we're getting our little translator putting right. his two cents in. <laughs> it appears that the reading during. Uh, the... Let's skip that part. Okay. okay. In other words, the, the, uh, the, the the point is, what is the original reading? Did Rashi say seven or three? And the oh, evident oh. is, is it makes it makes it sound. Um, oh, it's a, the whole thing. Uh, yeah, it's a whole big deal by our translator <laughs> trying to figure out which is the right one and. And um, uh, let me just see one second here what uh, the critical edition says. Uh, yeah, he, he basically says, he, he says seven. I mean, he's got a note to the other effect, but let, let's just say seven. So this comment is a lot shorter than, in fact, it is. Okay, so read the next one. And they shall be for signs. <laughs> yes, and they shall be for signs. The Hayu le Otot. <coughs> Go on. When the luminaries are eclipsed, it is an unfavorable mm -hmm. omen for the world. Mm -hmm. As it is said in Jeremiah, and from the signs of the heaven, be not dismayed, etc. When you perform the will of the Holy One, blessed be he, you need not fear retribution. Now, in the ancient world, mm -hmm. uh, eclipses are seen as uh, bad yeah. signs. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's referring to here. Um, and... Um, uh, and, and again, there's a particular term here he uses for, um, uh, which he's getting out of the Talmud, um, uh, or verb uh, for eclipse, lokin. Um, I have to, again, that sounds like an Aramaic verb. Uh, so, I mean, one thing you have to understand, Rashi's Hebrew is very Aramaicized. There, uh, Hebrew in, the, in that day uh, um, was very heavily influenced by Talmudic Aramaic and often uses Aramaic endings and Aramaic vocabulary. The one person who really tried to get up away from that was Maimonides, who the Mishnah Torah is written in a pure, pure rabbinic Hebrew. But most of the biblical commentators wrote in a kind of Aramaicized Hebrew. Okay? All right. And, um, read one more. And for appointed seasons. This refers to the future when the Israelites are destined to be commanded concerning the festivals, and they, the festivals, are reckoned from the first phase of the moon. Now, this is really interesting because, of course, if, if this is the beginning of creation, there are no Israelites yet, there are no right. people, mm -hmm. and yeah. so why does the Torah say Moadim, which is the term for festivals? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like an anachronism in the text. So, Rachi has to say to us... It's uh, foretelling the future when the Israelites will, uh, you know, uh, reckon their Moadim, their Chagim, mm -hmm. from the phases of the moon. Okay. And we for days, yep. the sun serves for half a day and the moon for half of it, so that you have a full day. Okay, so in the course mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of a 24-hour period, he's saying the moon is governing the night and the sun is governing the day. And well, years, at the end of 365 days... And some editions have 365 and a quarter. Mm -hmm. They complete their revolution through the 12 constellations of the Zodiac which serve them. And that constitutes a year. Others, and they return and start a second time to revolve on the spear like their first revolution. So there you go. There is the knowledge of the uh, solar year. 
that Rashi shows us um, that um, you know the solar the solar year he this was quite well known, and um, it's you know three hundred and sixty five and a quarter days, and what is it? They complete their revolution through the the zodiac are is what is the ecliptic, the 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 signs of the zodiac form a belt of stars that mm -hmm. rotate, and um, more or less correspond to the twelve months of the year. Yeah. I have a piece of jewelry right. that I inherited from a cousin with the signs of the zodiac. I can bring it in next week if you like. Sure. It's very beautiful. The, yeah, the Jews used the signs of the zodiac to represent the months of the year, like going back to uh, in fact, when I first to got it, early rabbinic times. Yeah, it also the thing also has a chai in it. When I first got it, I wasn't sure if it was properly kosher, so I asked a rabbi. Oh yeah. It was fine. So it was fine. <laughs> no, no. There are several, there are several <laughs> examples of ancient synagogues that yeah, have in the mosaic it. floor right. uh, yes. a zodiac mm -hmm. with human figures in some cases, and in the middle of it, um, the god Helios riding the chariots of the sun. Which you know, scholars mm -hmm. have argued over the fact mm -hmm. that Jews were using pagan uh, imagery right. doesn't prove that they were pagans in any way. It was just like artistic uh, stuff mm -hmm. that was used. All right, we'll do a little more. Marianne, you want to pick it up on... Um, 15? 15, yes. And they shall be for luminaries. In addition, they will serve in this function, that is, to shed light upon the world. Go on. The two great luminaries. All right, the Hebrew is now, um, uh, in, in, in our text, is verse 16, um, says that God made the two great lights... Okay, the, the, the biblical text, interestingly enough here, doesn't use the ter common terms for sun or moon to get away from the idea that the sun and the moon are demigods, by the way. Go on. Read on. Now he's going to give us a well-known midrash. They were midrush. created equal, but the moon was made smaller because it brought charges and said it is impossible for two kings to use the same crown. Okay, so here he's quoting from the, the again, from a midrash from the Talmud that because the moon complained that, you know, they were both equal, God made the, the moon smaller, then we get our translator, um, you know, to, um, who adds his comments on it. I will try in the future to try and knock all that stuff out. Um, okay. Uh, read, and the stars. How about Rashi explains? Uh, that, Rashi that's, that's, the, that's a translator. It's not Rashi. Oh, okay. The next paragraph. Yeah. And the stars, because he diminished the moon, he increased its hosts to appease it. Okay, so in other words, the moon was kind of upset that it wasn't as big as the bright as the sun, so God says, okay, so now I'll give you some stars. Go on. That is, the stars serve as the entourage of the moon. When it comes out, they accompany it, and when it sets, they too set. Interesting. Nice. Now, again, this may sound kind of fanciful that the sun and the moon seem to have personalities, <laughs> But in, in Rashi's day, they were not seen as inert matter. They were actually seen as celestial beings. Mm -hmm. So they actually could have personalities. Mm -hmm. Right? Not out of the... Not, you know, they were angels, essentially. They were, they were a form of angelic creature. All right? Verse 20, we're now uh, going to the um, creepy crawly... The creation of the creepy crawly things, um, where it says in the Hebrew, Vayomer Elohim... Yish Ritsu Hamaim Sheretz Nefesh Chaya. Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, meaning the fish, the Of Yofeif Al Haaretz Al Pnei Rakia Shemaim, and birds that fly above the earth, above great spans of the sky. So that's what he's talking about. Go on. Yeah. Living creatures. Nefesh Chaya. There should be life in them. Right. In other words, um, Nefesh Chaya is a general term for a living creature. So Rashi is in effect saying a creature in which there is life. Go on, a swarming. A swarming. Every living thing that is not much higher than the earth is sherets. sherets. Among the winged creatures such as flies, among the insects such as ants, beetles, and worms, and among the larger creatures such as the weasel, the mouse, the lizard, and their like. And so the fishes. Okay, so he's understanding sherets because sherets is used in, uh, in on the sixth day to also talk about what we would call uh, insects um, and uh, worms and uh, lizards and things of that sort, which of course in our 
in, in chapter 11 of uh, Leviticus are ones that are not kosher. Um, so he is saying because it means a swarming or a crawling of some sort, he's saying every living thing that is not much higher than the earth, in other words, on, you know, on the ground, and in which he's including the fish. All right, one more, and we'll, we'll stop with this one. Yes, the tananin, which is a very odd little thing, yeah. The great fish in the sea, meaning whales and... Ah, yeah, I think that's probably what he thinks it means. And, and others great fish in, in the sea the, and in the words of the Agada. This refers to the Leviathan and its name. For he created the male and female, and he slew the female and salted her away for the righteous in, mm. in the future. For if they would propagate, the word world could not exist because of them. Hatananim, again, it's missing what would normally be a yud in the plural. Okay. Uh -huh. It is it is written. Yeah. Okay. Meaning that the Leviathan did not remain two, but it's numbered. So this goes to this midrash. The word Leviathan in the Hebrew Bible is a primordial sea monster, not a whale. Okay. In the book of Job, in fact, it's probably a um, crocodile. Um, but... It's a primordial sea monster, and these uh, primordial sea monsters come under different terms. Leviathan's the most common one, and harkens back to an earlier Israelite cosmology where God has to fight yeah. the forces of chaos represented by the sea monsters to create the order of the universe. Genesis 1 preserves only a touch of that in this notion of the Tananin, which here shows that God is in complete control. He doesn't have to fight them. He creates them, right? Yeah. And so the authors of Genesis 1 may, in fact, have now reinterpreted it to mean creatures like whales. Rashi certainly probably understands that, but he also knows that the, that the Tananim also refers to Leviathan, some kind of primordial sea monster or giant fish, um, which um, the Midrash says there were two of them, and God killed the female to, so that they don't propagate and destroy the world, and then God salted them, you know, like... You know, made herring. smoked herring, yeah, salted, yeah, uh, salted herring, uh, or uh, lox, and and that the in the in the days to, in the days of the Messiah, the righteous will eat a, a kind of great banquet from uh, Leviathan's mate. You know that? Did you see the movie Leviathan? No, I haven't seen it yet. I heard it's and really good. It is, and I was I couldn't figure out what, but if it's used to represent. A chaotic yeah. situation. Then you know, that's exactly it's what it represents in the in yeah. the Hebrew Bible, Leviathan, Leviathan. But in the later text, Leviathan is reduced to this, right. or in Psalm 104, a plaything. Leviathan right. is God's little fishy that he plays yeah. with. Yeah. Is is right. sort of yeah. somebody uh, scholar said fighting. to me, it's God's he becomes God's rubber ducky. Yeah. You know, so. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it, there's a very interesting evolution of, the, of this concept of these primordial. Okay, we'll stop there. We'll carry on with uh, Genesis 1 and 2. Um, and um, I think from there we'll skip to the Akeda. And from, unless you want to do Cain and Abel, I mean, if there's any particular stories you want to look at Rashi on, but I think we'll do the Akeda. Mm -hmm. And then we'll move into maybe the book of Exodus and do a one or two things from Exodus. I want to sh do a little bit of his legal um, uh, uh, comment, you know, when he's commenting on halacha, so you get a sense of that. And then we'll move on to, um, you know, commentary on uh, outside the Torah. I haven't decided what yet, but since it's available to us, we might as well look at his commentaries on some of the other uh, material outside of in the rest of the Tanakh. And then, hopefully, I will try and find some translations of his uh, Talmudic commentary. Um, that's going to be harder, because there is no uh, easily available one. Um, and I, I don't want to spend hours transcribing it mm -hmm. and translating it. Um, so I'll do what I can in that regard, and also see if I can find some of his uh, responsa, because, which are really important, but I don't think they've ever been translated into English. You can then, teach us how to read Rashi. <laughs> Rashi script. Yay. All right. Well, okay. Have a good week. <laughs>